All right, uh, for the third tier of uh, uh, villains to face, start, let's start again with the amazing Spider-Man Dimension for having a guest star villain again, like I mentioned. All right, somewhere in this. And now we're finally back in New York. Yes. Well, this is a little too easy. A little and too. And surprise, surprise, leaves. Uh, it's the Juggernaut, bitch. I'm, I'm the Juggernaut, bitch. Things get any worse. So, hold on, we'll go, I'm gonna explain in a second. But we're actually having another guest, not properly as a villain, more like as a nuisance. Oh. Silver Sable! The now, mercenary. Jokino isn't voiced by Vinnie Jones, is he? No, he's voiced by Matt Willing. Reprising from uh, yep. something, I think. Yeah, basically, Vin Vinnie Jones played him in X-Men 3 the last time. So, Spidey's logic is, of course, <laughs> let the two go at each other. But the problem is that Juggernaut picked the fragment, so he needs to get him back. Of course. Problem is, Silver Sable is a bloodthirsty mercenary. Depending yeah, on the right. Is he Silver Surfer's brother? Is she Silver Surfer's, is she Silver no, Surfer's brother? No. Brother? She's a girl dwarf. That's sister, sorry. So, this distance, Silver Sable is actually a man. Immediately start with the fight against him. <laughs> This is not the and first time Spidey's tuckled with the Juggernaut, because... Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's actually worth mentioning. Like, the, re the entire reason also behind this level is a, really a giant tribute to that comic. Basically, I forgot which specific issue had actually this fight between Spider-Man and Juggernaut, and it became quite iconic on its own, even though the two don't have a lot in common to face against each other. So the devs actually decided to make it a tribute and go in for that. Forget, how did Spidey beat Juggernaut in the comic? Um, I think he kind of outsmarts him and get the gem? I don't think I don't remember. Basically, yeah, I might as well give the piece away. Um, the character of Juggernaut, aka Kain Marco, actually was created in uh, 1965 by Stanley and Jack Kirby, so the two main people at Marvel as uh, essentially one of the main villains of uh, the, yeah, the X-Men. Although he's not a mutant per se, he's actually Charles Xavier's brother. Step-brother. Step-brother, let's just say, yeah. Uh, during an expedition in South America, he stumbled upon a mystical temple with a specific uh, blood-red ruby called the Gem of, uh, help me with the pronunciation, Java, Kitorak, Saitorak, whatever it's name, essentially a, a gem, a chaos, a chaos hammer, call it that, uh, which granted him essentially invincible uh, strength and endurance. The only thing that is actual weakness is actually mind control, it makes him a bit stupid and successful to do telepaths, so in order to compensate he constantly wears this uh, brass helmet that uh, uh, shields him from uh, psychic attacks. We and basically, as ever since he has been part of the Bravo of the Mutant with Magneto, helping him occasionally here and there, and be a nuisance to the X Men. He is not uh, completely evil per se, he's just a bloodthirsty monster. That's pretty much it. And a dick. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a dick. But hey. it's, again, it's compared, to, compared to other villains, especially uh, from Spider Man's gallery, it's not too. Evil. Well, of course, I'm sure Jen Walters would agree with that. Oh, jeez. Yeah, there was that one time when She-Hulk was kind of at the pinnacle of her popularity. Some stupid writer thought, hey, how about we have She-Hulk have a one-night stand with the Juggernaut? Well, again, Jova, at this point, She-Hulk has pretty banged the entire Marvel Universe. Thankfully, thankfully, though, it was retconned that it was just scrolls. That's yeah, right, two sure. scrolls just happened to be disguised as Shioka and Juggernaut and decided to have a one-night stand. That's the official lore for it. That, that's the problem, the scrolls technically don't have to reproduce if I recall correctly, so... I mean, what the I really don't know, but hey, scrolls can put on disguises and it was pretty much that's the next the doom... That's power of Redcon, you bitch. For context, basically, um, <laughs> around the time of Civil War, there was, you know, a secret war going on which involved this race called the Skrull, who you may recall sort of showed up in the Avengers oh, movie. Oh! Oh! So, 
Oh, however, we kind of do need, need the uh, minions to fight in this case, so that's why Silver Sable is here. Another bit of history. Uh, Silver Sable is essentially a mercenary. She's mostly associated with the heroes for hire, so Iron Fist, uh, uh, Liu Cage, uh, and Daredevil, and all that jazz. Um, she's essentially a spoiled rich girl that uh, she so inherited from her father. Uh, the, the so-called Wild Pack, which is a clan of mercenaries that essentially re collect bounties around the world for the sake of moolah, basically. In this case, she's after Juggernaut, but uh, for some reason now Spidey has a bounty on his tail, probably uh, given from James John James. So, throw the level, we'll have to fight the uh, the uh, the pack, uh, sadly. Maybe this Wild one's pack. not from J. Jonah Jameson, since I think this was around the time where J. Jonah Jameson had more morals attached to him. I don't know. Considering, well, I don't even know what part of continuity may be setting, because remember, the, all this construction yard are at essentially at the, the base of the Oscorp uh, building. The Oscorp building is being rebuilt uh, around this time. Let's see, if this so... was made around the time of that what if J. Jonah Jameson adopted Peter Parker story, then this is back when they actually retconned his reason for hating Spider-Man to make more sense than he's good and I know it and I'm jealous. That was his original reason for it. Uh... Kinda petty. Thankfully, though, these days they go with the reasoning that basically, back when he was a reporter, J. Jonah Jameson had a lot of run-ins with mass folk, including, of course, the KKK, which is why he generally does not trust guys in masks. Because at this point, most of the Marvel Universe superheroes actually do work without masks or pretty much have come forth about their identity, even currently. Like, Spidey's one of the very few who actually has a secret identity at this point. Pretty much. It's so ironic considering it's so ironic that the fact that uh, after so many years, whatever Civil War tried to accomplish actually managed to happen anyway. So. With, thankfully, yeah. without having to be as despicable as Civil War. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a problem, Pedro, also. The fact that uh, at the end of the day, whatever Civil War tried to accomplish was still bad and it still managed to come to pass no matter what. You know, the sad thing is that there's actually a comic where a hero does discuss with Peter, maybe it would be better for you to just come clean with your identity. I mean, go practically everyone's come clean with the identity thing at this point in the Marvel Universe. Heck, some even benefit but no, better we from it. Have that, um... So, yeah, anyway, back to the Juggernaut. The Juggernaut's overall power scale and setting is that basically. He's unstoppable, jet, essentially. Yeah. As yeah, in, he, he can't be stopped. The unstoppable juggernaut, so yeah. Which is why he actually fought to a tie with Hulk. Yeah. Well, th but that's the thing. Uh, Hulk uh, in the comics at this point, well, not at this point, but at least around that time, was at a point where everything that uh, was fighting him essentially made him stronger by reaction alone. Essentially, uh, Hulk became stronger and stronger, whatever, the more uh, tougher opponents happened. The only one who managed to stop him in uh, World War Hulk was Sentry, and even that fight was like a draw at the end, so... That was that one time Spider-Man beat him, because again, Spider-Man popularity. Yeah, yeah. And they even had that uh, back way back in the day, that uh, fated duel of uh, what's, what's stronger, Hulk or the Thing. Because we, we kind of at that point, we were very similar characters, so the fan were demanding a clash. It was even to the point where the thing could actually turn back to his normal human self. Yeah. And then there was a clay. Oh, go on. So basically, we're turning uh, Marvel Comics into professional wrestling. Fans want to see these two go oh. at it, so let's Oh, Pedro, 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 you should have seen the DC vs. Marvel Comics events. Like, let's see, one time they had Superman against Captain America, second time they had Superman against Hulk. And here I thought comic books were supposed to be a storytelling medium, but hey, what do I know? Hey, 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 if it's any consolation... See, Pedro, remember, Pedro, as soon as someone discovered that uh, heroes fighting each other instead of the, guy, the bad guy was more profitable, everything went downhill somehow. If it's any consolation, after one of the DC and Marvel crossover events, they then had a neat event where basically, um, heroes got... Basically, where they got fused into composite characters yeah. from each. Like, we had Wolverine merged with Batman, uh, Spider Man merged with Superboy, Storm Howard merged with. with Hobo. Hobo, yeah. sorry. And Storm yeah. merged with Wonder Woman, which was pretty freaking awesome, I'll admit. And Captain Marvel fused with Captain Marvel. 
which yeah. turned into Captain Marvel. I'm still, <laughs> looking for, I'm, I'm, I'm still looking forward to see what, uh, if there's going to be a Hour of the Dark movie in the MCU, what, and what exactly could they even do with that? Who knows, maybe Phase 4. At this point, he, if anything is going to happen, from what people may speculate, Phase 4 may actually open the gates of hell, for all you know. I mean, you know, they gotta up the ante somehow after Avengers 4. They'll probably make it, like, considering the, the concept of Howard the Duck is ridiculous as all hell, it probably fits very well. I think it'd make it probably one of the most comedic ones, kind of like the Guardians of the Galaxy, because True. it's such a... It, Howard the Duck is such a silly, fucking ridiculous character that well, to be, to be trying to do... Because a bit more than... Sorry, go ahead. I'm trying to do with the, what, the, what the George Lucas produced movie, yeah. it, like, where it took itself way too seriously. Too Basically, if you don't know, most of the stories are that like, were comedic in tone, but we were still treated like uh, investigation mysteries. Hold on. So kind of like Time for a slow We. Yeah, it's not very effective if it's in first person. Spider ah. Sense helps out like that. Not just my directing to who said he who jealously guards his fears secretly yearns to bring them about. Either Ooh. him or Irving Forbush. Uh let's just go with uh, a bit more poetic. But yeah, basically the stories of our attack were silly, yes, but we were still treated like investigation mystery. Basically, when our the duck essentially re resigned of being an earthling uh, and accepted to stay on Earth on the planet. He opened a detective agency, so he decided to went on solving mysteries in uh, uh, Cliff. Uh, Cli uh, what, what's I forgot the, the town that he resided in Cleveland, Jova. Ah, uh, yeah, I think it was Cleveland. Surprisingly, a Marvel Universe superhero that didn't stick around in New York City. Yeah, although one time he had his office right next to the one of She-Hulk. Yeah, those were funny. Uh, so his stories, despite being very silly, like one of his villains is literally called Dr. Bong, yes. Um, it's still, it, it has very, they still have their charm and they function as stories of their own. Uh, so I can see even as a TV series of Netflix, it can work in some form of capacity. And if there's one thing that uh, Marvel uh, Studios actually has proven it, even with the most obscure of characters, they can do something with it. Yeah. So, something effective, well, I mean. Well, yeah. I wonder, anyway, if, so I wonder if they're gonna make... I'm not seeing a lot of lack of color in this area. <laughs> Mostly because I'm using the, the spider sense constantly. Yeah, I shouldn't. Yeah. But it's mostly for highlighting again the uh, spider emblems and for the sake of having knowing what the, where the enemies are. It's mostly on my fault. It's though. like Detective Vision in the Arkham games. Yeah. Visually, it's not the most pleasing, but it's so useful that you'll find yourself using it a lot. Here we go. Yeah, basically, here's how the the, the wild pack actually works. Most, a lot of them have guns, so using the, the, the disarming move. Uh, should be easy enough, and if you don't have it at this point, I don't know what to tell you because it's very easy to unlock. Uh, then you have the ninjas with the katanas, because of course. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, some smoke screen, but otherwise they're straightforward in attacking, just using the dodge button. Yeah, I forgot to mention how to dodge things. Basically, you press and hold R2, and Spidey essentially locks onto the enemy, the nearest enemy that's uh, coming, and uh, yeah, and uh, the, depending on where he, 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 he telegraphs his attack, by moving the analog stick in the, the different directions, he actually dodges the attack. Trust me, it's actually more easy than it sounds. Uh, I'm just I was gonna say, it sounds uh, kind of finicky, especially when you're in a room with a bunch of enemies. No, again, but when it comes to that, uh, uh, the enemies uses the Assassin's Creed strategy of attacking you one at a time. But uh, it, it's really not useful against guns instead, because, you know, Spidey cannot dodge bullets like that. This is why I did always like the disarm ability from Spider-Man 2 and 3. Yeah, yeah, why? yeah it, it, it goes back, he actually is back here, but worse only with enemies with guns. 
Yeah, I mean, which is weird because it worked on pretty much all enemies wielding weapons. It's a shame they didn't bring that back. But I guess we classified many we many weapons just as you know enemies we marry. So even removing their weapons will not affect them that much. So speaking of the wild pack, so Dio, um, is Silver Sable currently a good guy or a bad guy? Because she's one of good those question because she flips up a lot. Anyway, Mo um. Yeah. For the sake of actually, I forgot to mention the character was created in 1985, so relatively recently, by Tom DeFalco and Ron Friends. Ah, good Basically, old Tom DeFalco. He's yeah. one of the better Spider-Man writers. He's had a few slip-ups, though. <laughs> he uh, he made Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four crossover, the one that had to use Office Max to find also, Doctor Doom. For context, she was actually born in a fictional state. But basically, she was essentially very close to Latveria, so practically she had Doctor Doom next door. Um, but she managed to not having her being conquered. So what do you think of the continuity where she's actually Silvermane's daughter? Uh, because of course we needed that. I, uh, I mean, to be fair, it worked in the TV really show. I, well, that's the thing, Joe. I didn't really particularly care about Silver Sable in general. Especially because we gave her so minuscule roles and not important anyway for the story we're trying to go. Um, it's just like, well, there was a recent Spider-Man arc where Peter Parker's grieving because Silver Sable supposedly sacrificed herself and Peter, of course, has to feel guilty about that. Yeah, yeah, but she has come back to, uh, to life and she asked Spider-Man's help uh, in against Norman Osborn recently, at least. Yep. And oh, yeah! Apparently she survived, because supposedly she was killed by Rhino, but uh, she managed to survive thanks to a gadget uh, that, you know, cloaked there. So they pulled the excuse of, oh, we don't actually see her dying, so she's technically alive. Oh yeah, speaking of Norman Osborn, let's talk about that. Currently, Norman Osborn is the new Carnage. Uh, well, the are new. You well, uh, okay. Well, that's, yeah, I, I, that's I know. even the okay, point so. of doing something like that. Okay, if I will admit, what they're doing. Jumping oh, the shark big time. We've done everything in Over Osborne at this point. Uh, for context's sake, basically, in the same arc where they actually referenced One More Day, in fact, because Loki, at this time, owes Spider-Man a debt for saving his daughter. Yeah, surprisingly, a lot of villains owe Spidey. Even Doctor Doom owes him. Yeah. Basically, though, Loki, apparently, does somehow know about that deal that he made with Mephisto and hinted at him possibly using it. Of course, even though Marvel hinted at it... He didn't use it's it for that, just he just used it to raid to save some random guy. But anyway, in that same arc, Norman Osborn has gotten his hands on the Carnage symbiote. At this time, Norman's kind of a bit disfigured because of some goblin overdose stuff that had to do with Superior Spider-Man more on that later. But basically, at this time, Norman's logic is, you know, I'm crazy enough to control the Carnage symbiote. And it what works actually. He manages. He actually manages to cut a deal with the Carnage symbiote. It helps you say stuff. Who has fire moves now? Yep, the Carnage symbiote has fire moves now. Dio. Um. Uh, okay. Basic logistic in case you're one of the three people who actually don't know about this. Uh, but I think I already mentioned uh, back when talking about Ultimate uh, Peter in this case. A sy the symbiote is an um, organic alien life form that essentially gives you superpowers but tries to take control of your mind. He has only two major weaknesses, sound waves and fire. You want to know the sad thing is like, oh, with Venom, while Venom is more resistant to fire but still gets weakened by it, sound is his bigger weakness. It's the Carnage symbiote who's actually weaker to fire than he is sound. In fact, that was exploited during Maximum Carnage. I mean, okay. Oh, but it gets even better. As of now, Norman Osborn has beaten Peter Parker to a standstill. So what does he do? He leaves him alive, basically threatening him, saying, Okay, from now on, you're no longer Spider-Man. I see you in the mess, and I will kill you and everyone you know and love. So, Norman, this is Peter Parker, the one guy who has fooled your plans, the one guy who's oh, always my. seen through you. I mean, okay, yeah, he technically didn't stop you while you were Iron Patriot and in charge of the Avengers, but... To be fair, that was when you were not really in his city anymore. The point being, you think you can control Spider-Man after, you know, you've already killed his girlfriend, tried to kill his wife at some point, supposedly stolen killed his and daughter. And that's still uh. canon for some reason. 
The point being is like, well, Norman, you left Peter Parker, Spider-Man, alive, and just threatened him. Like, I, if there's ever any evidence that he is flipping insane, there you go. Are we even trying at Marvel Comics at this point? Remember to you, Dan no. Slott. Dan Slott was hyping this up because this is supposed to be his big final hurrah. And don't get me wrong, Michael, there is some cool execution with Norman Osborn wielding the Carnage symbiote. But seriously, he's letting Peter live? Like, I'm sorry, even the Joker sometimes decides that it's time to try to kill Batman, just to be random. So, at this point, uh, yeah, Marvel Comics is nothing but a collection of fan fiction, bad fan fiction. Yeah, like, aside from the movies, well, I would say the video games are non existent at this point, uh, supposedly. Oh, there's the upcoming Spider Man uh, video game, obviously, but I mean, aside from that, uh, unlike before, there are not many licensed Marvel uh, games. Uh, uh oh. I don't um, like how he's welcoming me must to go fight him. Basically, we're about to reach uh, near the end. I think. Oh no, we have in um, another rescue mission before. Uh, anyway, uh, aside from the Spider-Man video game, we're not getting. Supposedly, Square Enix has a deal now where Crystal oh. Dynamics is doing supposedly an uh, Avengers some project, games, but we haven't seen anything yet. Which is uh, what I'm well, hoping. Maybe this C3. I'm hoping that we maybe. get to see what Avenger, what Project Avengers is. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, goody, Silver Sable's got a Russian accent this time. Her accent yeah. tends to change. Sometimes she's British, sometimes well, she's Well, she's kind of Eastern European, so it makes it holy shit. Except that time when she had an Australian accent. Well, then again, that might have just been a different continuity. Don't worry, that yeah, building yeah, was yeah, the way you, um... Don't worry, that building was under construction, so no one was in there. I was trying to talk to Joe, but I forgot I was muted. <laughs> anyway, um, the way you um, the way you said that thing with Joe makes me imagine the Pinky and the Brain song, but with the lyric with, with, with some different lyrics. You are going to Harley Quinn and the Joker with the intro. And then she says, like, um, Say, Jay, what are you gonna do today? The same thing we do every night, Harley! Try to kill Batman! <laughs> <laughs> the Joker and the so, ba so basically, now face. it's actually simple. Yeah, you need to rescue, rescue, quote unquote, three, um, three workers, and maybe then turning off the gas pipes so you can pass through the wreckage that uh, Juggernaut has left. This one works better than the others because this is generally a wide enough area. And let's and just say there's a and bit And it's actually of... really fast to do. Yeah. Again, when it comes to Amazing Spider-Man levels, this one's definitely the best. Huh, go figure. The one taking place in New York for Amazing Spider-Man's the best. <laughs> also, don't bother with the enemies because they respawn uh, all the time, so you might, ju you might just not care at this point. Huh, so this time we go. don't have to care about the enemies, unlike that other section in Spider-Man Noir. Bit inconsistent, but oh well. That too. Uh, but yeah, uh, like again, Crystal Dynamics supposedly is cooking something. But aside from that, uh, and the movies, uh, the Marvel Comics has been a constant shit show for the past what uh, four years uh, to be generals. Uh, I mean, we only just recently got mm -hmm. Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom three back on anything that was in seven gen. On, on the comic side, Joe, but like... Oh, what about you talking about the, the games as well, the because... The only last major event that I think I consider decently good may have been uh, uh, Spider Island, and that's still saying a lot. Hey, Spider Island, that finally marked the end of Peter and Carly Cooper's relationship. Much celebrations were held. And hey, it looked... Well, Don't also you even wasted, bother. You Squirrel, Girl, Squirrel Girl's character once again. Wait, wait, hold on. Squirrel Girl was in Spider Island? Yep, she was in that period where she was the nanny for Duke Cage and Jessica Jones' daughter. What exactly was she doing during that time? Like, wait, let no, me guess, tie-in. Yeah, tie-in, remember. She, it's the same thing that happened during Fear itself. She was just happening to doing her nanny chores uh, back then. So she wasn't even in the main comic book event, which is weird because almost every other one Avengers Wise was there. Kind of makes sense because the main antagonist of that one has history with Captain America. Oh yeah, that kind of history. Yeah. So the main thing Marvel actually have going for the are their movies. 
Well, at this, point, at, yeah. at this point, pretty much Jishiro, because but, let me the, put the, 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 guy, the guy currently in front, the currently in charge of Marvel Comics, is a, joke, a guy called Joe Kazada, and he absolutely hates Marvel fans. He hates them. Like, he needs, and he goes out of his way to piss us off. And we already like, talk about the other, Ron Perlmutter, which is equally a douchebag, so and great before, couple. And before Joe Casada, there was Bill Jemis. I mean, hell, even, 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 the, even the Marvel films that were suffering while uh, that Perlmutter guy was overseeing the film division as well. Yeah, like he's yeah. tarnished the MCU with the Inhumans now, thanks. Wait, well, wait, 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 Ron Perlmutter's in charge of the TV stuff? Is, is that okay, 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 no. here's the thing, back well, 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 then... Well, to be fair, Iron, Iron Fist was a shit show, too. Basically, here's the thing, Ike Perlmutter was in charge of Marvel Entertainment at the time. Um, you know, before Kevin Feige managed to get more influence when Disney stepped in. Essentially, back when Captain Marvel was, well, trying to be made, Ken Fe Kevin Feige had to strike a deal with Ike Perlmutter. Basically, the only way he would let Captain Marvel be an actual movie was if Perlmutter got to do his own stuff with stuff like the Inhumans, you know, to be the new X-Men or whatnot. So, yeah, unfortunately Kevin Feige's hands were tied on that. Like, if Ike Perlmutter had his way, we would have never had stuff like Black Panther, and he's also the reason that, you know, I War Machine changed actors because, oh, nobody will recognize us changing the look of a black man. Yeah, he's openly racist and sexist yeah. as well. Thankfully, Mom, though, Disney then... stepped in, though, and now thanks to that, Ike Perlmutter's is, um, his, uh, his influence was kind of, uh, yeah, controlled. So basically, he, very... I know they've changed recently, but I love he just yeah. comes in, it's like, he's racist and sexist, then they brought in Disney. Yeah, I, I, it, <laughs> it really is ironic how much Disney has changed and now as to how they were back then with you sexism. Mean, and... yeah. yeah. It's also, um, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because, um, one of the reasons that in the Humans TV show was made just this was because they didn't have the rights to X-Men, and now look what's happening. What, it basically, it has to do with Ike Perlmutter's, uh, basically his hatred of anything that okay, was not a part of the on, MCU. We're about to get, uh, now it's time for the final boss fight against Juggernaut. Which is of course on top of a skyscraper. Well, Spy has an idea. Once again, he will try to outsmart him. Come here, run. Time to scrape you off my shoe once again. Oh shit. Alright, first a first person confrontation in order to, you know, remove the element and everything. I gotta say though, is I love Disney's um, strategy. For, 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 for Spider-Man, they, they 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 make they make buddy buddies with Sony. So to, to get the rights to X-Men and Fantastic Four, they just outright buy the, the, the whole house. movie studio. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Dues, but hasn't Fox been kind of, you know, on financial struggles uh, in recent years? No, not, not, uh, not No, I'm... Fox are like the third uh, richest film like company. the third biggest studio. Well, then, uh, well, then again... Well, they, well, they, well, well, I guess I'm well, guessing well, it, apparently I'm... the whole thing, apparently the things come about was because, you know, the you new know, Rupert Murdoch who owns Fox. Well, Dreads, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, he also, he also, he also run, he also, he's also a, a huge part of uh, Sky TV oh, here well, in the UK. Yeah. He wanted to buy that, but um, the only way he would do that is to sell off one of his big IPs, and that's Fox. Yes, Leo? What if you start moving down? Here we go. Good point. So essentially, Spidey is dropping him from a 50th uh, floor building. To his death. He's a juggernaut, no, Wivs. Oh, that was a weird pop-up. And Spider-Man died. It's okay, he had juggernaut cushioning his fall. Best pin cushion there is. <laughs> the amazing Spider-Man. With a glorious and great... The problem, is, great that, uh, juggernaut the problem is that now Juggernaut is activating the fragment accidentally. Oh, no. Oops. Here's the interesting thing. No, it's not nicer. No. Basically, now he's actually more aggressive. He's actually his uh, moves can cause shockwaves and everything. But the gist of it is that, as Madame Webb would say, the fragment is actually in conflict with the, his own gem of Psychorac. I'll stick with that name, which makes him actually very vulnerable. So he has become essentially a glass cannon. Excellent. Yeah, there you go. With great power, vulnerability. <laughs> anyway, continue. 
yeah, uh, basically, um, Fox wanted to buy Sky, Dig Sky PLC, which is the big TV company around here in the UK. But um, but but they but they decided to sell off um, most of Fox in order to please all the um, you know, all the all the big uh, media watchdogs. Although recently, um, guess who started a bidding war for Sky? Again. Oh. Um, there's a bidding war between um, Fox and of all people Comcast. Oh. Which well, may be the one. Your poison. I'll take Disney over Comcast in a day because Comcast are legit terrible. Which is which is interesting because um, Comcast to us Brits is like is like if you're like trying to ask an American what BT is, they wouldn't know the answer. Yeah. Well, probably round and around and around she goes. Whoa, Spidey must have been working out to swing the juggernaut like that. Yeah. Although General Electric's apparently a thing around here, so there's no reason. Also, you do this tall Hulk's thunder clap, Walter. Don't worry, Hulk will beat him up for that. <laughs> basically, America's taking us over. The end of the world. Well, but yeah, basically, to sum up, Shiro, the, the movie division is probably the best thing you will ever see about Marvel from now on, and probably that's a good thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some good, there are some good Marvel comics out there, like the Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, which is actually a complete fresh. Well, okay. Again, Joel, it's but... so scarce in between. It's more the yeah. exception than the rule, and it shouldn't be like that. Well, that's why I say it's like, well, go for stuff like Spider-Man Renew Your Vows, which is pretty much its own continuity anyway, so you don't even really have to read up on previous stuff. And I guess there's the MC2, or there used to be the MC2 before Marvel decided, Oh, you know that popular universe we have? Let's make it non-canon and discontinue it. Yeah. And, uh, they're... Well, because Joe Casado hates us. And hey, I guess there's Captain America Sam Wilson. He's fine. Shame about what had to be done to get him as Captain America, yeah, but honestly, he's fine. When Cap actually supposedly died at the end of Civil War and uh, uh, the comics here, don't what, worry. Which is a shame because Sam Wilson is a legit good Captain America. It's just the main issue. It's, there's always going to be the elephant in the room. Hey, anyone else remember Captain America Steve Rogers number one with Hail Hydra? Yeah. Uh, God dang it, Secret Empire. I'll just enjoy the MCU. I mean, okay, okay, okay. The sad thing about <laughs> stuff like Secret Blade Empire Hero. was like, well, that would have been a good take for an Elseworld story, but no, it's the actual canon mainline continuity. I can, I can just imagine, I can imagine the outrage if for some reason they start incorporating the more questionable recent Marvel comic plot developments into the MCU. Well, apparently from what I can tell you is that from what we know so far, apparently they're changing Captain Marvel's origin in the new movie, which is, to be fair, yeah, let's just, let's just say Captain Marvel didn't have the best origin story. Let's well, the Marvel, Captain Marvel movie is apparently going to take place in the 1990s. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, basically, she was tied to the two decree race. The only major problematic story actually she had was in Avengers 2200, but it's a kind of worse for another day. For now, <laughs> basically, this level, yeah, like Java said, probably the best of the three amazing Spider-Man ones. Although, again, honestly, that uh, section, one, set, one or two sections maybe could have been trimmed just a bit, but my only down one oh, is, uh, was still fine. I yes, think there was a bit of missed potential, though, to have a double fight with both Juggernaut and Silver Sable. Like, Silver agree. Sable just Silver kind Sable of just leaves. Disappears. Yeah, she's just for cheats and giggles. Anyway, next time we'll do the third and final Ultimate uh, um, Spider-Man's level. And let's just say that uh, for that level we're reserving a special kind of villain from Spidey. Something that should have showed up uh, sooner or later. See ya. Yes. See ya. See ya. See ya. See ya.